This video is brought to you by our fans on Patreon. What would happen if we stopped helping honeybees? Would they disappear from the face of the earth? What would happen to beekeepers around the globe? There is a rising trend among beekeepers to let natural selection take its course in selecting honeybees that are resistant to varroa mites, the biggest enemy of honeybees. Some people see this approach as problematic because a significant amount of bees would die in the process. And this would result in many beekeepers losing their operations with huge consequences for our food supply chain. Furthermore, the process is not fast and could take decades to see the results. Can science help to speed up this process? When I talk to beekeepers throughout North America, especially the ones with more experience, it is clear to identify a sentiment of nostalgia for the past. They miss the good old times, as they like to say, when they didn't need to be concerned about the honeybee's health all the time and could ultimately enjoy a better life. Many beekeepers are considering quitting their jobs, and I understand why. It is no longer easy to keep bees. Currently, in order to ensure the survival of honeybees for pollination of our crops, beekeepers must invest a significant amount of time and money. Despite all this effort, there are no guarantees of success. In my opinion, the modern beekeeping industry is facing a crisis it is conflicted with two different beekeeping philosophies. In this video, I will explain this issue and I would love to know your thoughts on that if it's possible. Since the introduction of the main beekeeping problems of the century, such as American fall brood, turkey mites, and the biggest enemy of honeybees of all times, the varroa mite, the modern beekeeping industry has focused on finding solutions to fight these pests. A modern approach to beekeeping problems is to utilize all available resources to develop new solutions for each specific issue. This can take a form of new products and services and protocols, Especially since the introduction of varroa mites around 40 years ago, significant efforts have been made to combat this pest. These efforts have grown exponentially after the emergency of the colony collapse disorder in 2006. And boy, we have a lot of things to help the honeybees today. At the first glance, the situation might seem promising. However, all the resources we've invested so far have not only failed to solve the problem of controlling the varroa mite, but have also, in my opinion, snared the entire modern beekeeping industry. The problem is that these new procedures and products have led to a greater dependence of chemicals for bees to survive. Modern honeybees, as I like to call them, are highly reliant on beekeepers for their survival. The more beekeepers fight to keep these bees alive, the more they become trapped in a cycle of dependence. On the other hand, some places on the planet initially suffered from the introduction of these pests because of the limited resources. They had no choice but to let the bees die and start fresh with the surviving bees. However, these places are now perhaps beginning to reap the benefits of what was once considered a misfortune. Take a moment to think about that. There is already bees in other parts of the world that produce quality honey with minimal interference and as a result at a much lower cost. It's only a matter of time before these competitors to grow, get stronger and get more powerful in a capitalist system. You can try to protect your own market with sanctions and other measures, but ultimately, it is inevitable that a cheaper, high-quality product will prevail no matter what. Efforts to speed up the selection process of resistant honeybees already exist. And we know that honeybees with greater hygienic behavior can handle pests and diseases better, including varroa mites. So I hit the road to see for myself, in the field, with real beekeepers, the performance of Dr. Keras Wagner's research. UBO, short for unhealthy brood odor, is a new assay developed in her lab at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro to help beekeepers select honeybees' genetic stocks with higher hygienic behavior in the hope that these bees will perform better with less use of labor and pesticides. Essentially, Dr. Wagner isolated in the laboratory the odors of sick honeybee brood to identify honeybees triggered by those compounds to perform hygienic behavior. 
making this a fantastic tool for beekeepers to select bees with this highly desired genetic trait. I made a full video about this in the past if you want to delve into the details, link in the description of this video. A group of beekeepers is currently testing this new product in the field and I had the chance to follow one of them in the state of Vermont. The entire team was prepared and excited to test the hygienic behavior capability of several honeybee colonies. During the test, some team members opened the hives to find good frame of brood while others sprayed the UBO compounds on the surface of the selected testing area. The device used for spraying would likely be included with the product in the future. Once the spraying is done, the frame is returned to the colony. And after two hours, the amount of uncapped brood is quantified. If the bees did not inspect the sprayed brood area, it indicates low hygienic behavior. On the other hand, if they open up some of the brood cells to inspect, it shows more hygienic behavior compared with the previous scenario. However, the true excitement comes when a result like this occurs clearly demonstrating that these bees have strong hygienic behavior and therefore are more capable to deal with diseases by themselves and can be used for queen breeding. So a few years ago, we started to leverage the diagnostic lab at the UVMB lab to start helping bee breeders to help them better select hardier, more pest and pathogen resistant stock that's local to our environment um, here in Vermont. So um, we started off working with um, Mike Palmer of French Hill Apiaries and providing field and lab support doing monthly Varroa and Nozema counts. We did some virus assays for him also, and we started doing freeze kill brood assays as well to help identify some hygienic behavior. Um, and then last year, we started collaborating with Kara Wagoner of University of North Carolina, Greensboro because she um, started to develop this UBO assay, um, the unhealthy brood odor assay, that does a better job of identifying um, hygienic stock for beekeepers. It expanded to now not just helping Mike Palmer with French Hill Apiaries, but um, Andrew Monkris as well at Lemon Fair Honeyworks and also Jack Rath here at 100 Acre Wood Apiary. Um, and it's expanding to other bee breeders as well. So it's been a really awesome way to get these bee breeders kind of working together, the bee lab um, helping to support their efforts in, in selecting for more hygienic disease and, and pest resistant, resistant bees. Jack, why do you think this is going to be important for beekeepers? Well, I, I firmly believe that Varroa is the biggest challenge that we're facing. And I think that just trying to find the next chemical that's going to manage it is not going to work in the long run. And I think that we have to do all that we can to help bees fight varroa on their own. And this UBO assay is identifying perhaps a different trait than the freeze-killed brood assay. I had done some of that um, two years ago and used it selecting my breeders. It was quite interesting seeing how the stock from the best of the freeze-killed did on the UBO, UBO assay, and there's certainly some correlation. The high freeze-kill responsive lines do better with the UBO. I do play around a little bit with instrumental insemination and the idea of being able to combine these traits and combine these lines with instrumental insemination is, is pretty exciting. And to see whether we can kind of concentrate the trait in in some lines. So later on in the season, we're gonna be doing some grooming assays. We're gonna be using screen bottom boards and looking at mite drops and examining those mites for, um, for any injuries that the bees might have caused um, indicator, an indicator of, of grooming behavior on bees. And later we're going to see if we can cross um, bees that are high performing groomers with high UBO performing bees. Um, and we are going to be using uh, our instrumentally insemination for that as well. Um, and then this year we're also looking at the heritability of the UBO trait in both open mated systems and instrumentally inseminated systems. So we're going to be um, following daughters of high UBO that are either instrumentally inseminated or open mated um, and seeing how those perform and how much of the UBO trait gets lost after um, a generation. And it's pretty exciting to have more than one trait that we're looking for because 
I think that if you're using one test, you're limiting the bee's ability. You're only selecting for those that do one thing, which I think unnecessarily shrinks your genetic basis. You know, bees have lots of different strengths, and I don't want to tell them how to control mites. I just want them to do it yeah. and using as many different methods as as possible. I kept bees before Varroa, and it was really different. Yeah. You put the honey supers on in the spring, you took them off in the fall. That's it. And you kept expanding because you couldn't help it. And yeah. it's it's definitely different now. And I feel, especially for the beginners that, you know, start doing this because they're excited. They want to help the bees. They want to help the environment. And they didn't need to know that they needed to become pest monitors. And I don't think that'll go away, but I think we can improve it. That's the hope. This conflict between two different beekeeping philosophies is very interesting and I will follow this along closely. To be honest, I'm not sure what's the best course of action here. Should we continue to fight and intervene as much as possible to keep the system running? Or should we step back and let the bees figure things out by themselves? Or there is a middle ground where science can assist the bees in helping themselves. What do you think? It is a complicated subject, but it is encouraging to see scientists getting involved and bringing potential solutions to the table. I'm very excited to see what the future holds. So what do you think should be done? Please leave your comment in the comment section below, and if you have some extra time, watch this video right here to learn more about this. And if you want to support my work, please consider becoming a patron by visiting patreon.com slash insidethehive.tv. Thanks for watching, insidethehive.tv, the show about bees. See you guys next week.